I can draw a pretty straight line from the decision to remove shop class from high school to every major problem we've discussed so far. Yeah. People say, Mike, why is college so expensive? Well, how could it not be? We've told a whole generation, you're screwed if you don't borrow the money. You've got to share with people your path to being an opera singer. When I was in what they now call middle school, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, I took wood shop and I took metal shop and I took welding and I, auto, all of these things. And, you know, I, I learned how to use power saws, sanders, how to do staining, all this. I got in metal shop and, you know, I, I learned how to do. You know, how, how you build, bend sheet metal and put these things together. Sure. And I learned how to countersink things, use all these tools. And that stayed with me my entire life. Even if you didn't take the classes, when you went through school, you knew the classes were there. Yeah. So at least you had an understanding that the vocations themselves existed. It might not have been for you, but at least you could look across the topography of your educational neighborhood and say, okay, there's this, there's this, there's that, there's that. When we took shop class away, we removed all the optical proof of these things from a whole generation of yeah. kids. Now, what more persuasive thing can you do to assign diminished value to a thing than to remove it from sight? So I can draw a pretty straight line from the decision to remove shop class from high school to every major problem we've discussed so far. Yeah. People say, Mike, why is college so expensive? Well, how could it not be? We've told a whole generation, you're screwed if you don't borrow the money. I grew up very poor. And as a function of that, I, I took these classes because you got something broke, you better know how to fix it because you can't call, you know, we don't have money for a service call. We don't have the money to do this. So you learn how to fix it. You learn how to screen doors falling off. You better know how to go get the stuff and fix it. And it was functional for me. And that's remained with me the rest of my life. One of the smartest things I ever did, and I'll pat myself on the back for this. My youngest son, Jordan, came to me one time and said, what do you want for Christmas? It's, it's getting that time. And he said, you're the hardest person in the world to buy for because when you want something, you just show up with it. <laughs> so there's nothing left at the end of the year. And I, I thought about it for a little bit. I said, I'll tell you what I want. I, I want you to give me an hour a week, no phones, no TV, nobody else, just you and me, to talk about anything I want to talk about. And now he said, done. I said, no, 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 no. I want you to go think about this because I'm not talking about two or three times. There's 52 weeks in the year. I'm talking about 52 hours of your time with me talking about anything I want to talk about. And he came back a couple of days later and he said, it, it's a deal. Now, we probably did 40 mm -hmm. out of 52. It wasn't perfect. It was probably me more than him. But during that time, I, I talked to him about taxes, insurance on cars, bank accounts, how to drain the oil out of the car, holes in the radiator, talked about cleaning gutters, talked about everything that he would never have had any idea about whatsoever. After a couple of months, he started coming around, what are we gonna talk about this week? It, it caught on and started traction. It was some of the most quality time we spent talking about things they had stripped from curriculum, taken away, didn't teach about how to live once you got out into the world. It's the difference, I think, between a, a lecture and a sermon versus a a conversation. Yeah. Once you lay your hands on the conversation, well, then it becomes a pitch. It becomes something else, not a bad thing necessarily. But think about the last 50 minutes we've just had. You don't have a single note in front of you, and neither do I. The reason people 
watched us, mm. I, I think, early on, is that they saw something that felt authentic coming out of their TV. And I want to make a point that you alluded to before, too. You said that when we pay attention to a thing, we pay respect in a way that, well, there's really just no substitute for it. But when you pay attention to a thing in a place like this, and when you point one, two, three, four, five, seven cameras at two dudes, that means somewhere somebody thinks you and I are going to say it's something that might be of merit. There's one thing I got to ask you about before we stop, because this is something, you know, you and I have spent time together before, and I'm not often surprised. This was a surprise. You've got to share with people your path to being an opera singer, because I find that an astounding <laughs> pathway. How long did you sing and for what opera? Well, when I learned from my granddad that I would not, in fact, be following in his footsteps, he said to me, look, you can be a tradesman. Just get a different toolbox. And that was awfully good advice. It's not what I wanted to hear, but I went to a community college and I learned how to do a bunch of things I had no interest in. I learned how to write. I learned how to sing. I learned how to act. I studied all sorts of different things that I didn't care about. In other words, I wasn't following my passion at all. I did think it would be fun to get into the TV business. And to do that, I needed an agent. And my agent explained that I couldn't get representation unless I was in the Screen Actors Guild. And the Screen Actors Guild explained that I couldn't get my union card unless I had an agent, which would allow me to audition for shows that would get my card. And anyway, the opera was a loophole. If I could fake my way into the opera, I could get my AGMA card and then buy my way into the Screen Actors Guild. That's why I crashed an audition in 1984. I learned the shortest aria I could find. It was the coat aria from uh, Puccini's La Boheme. And I sang it like I knew what I was doing in Italian. And uh, they knew I was a fraud. Of course, you speak Italian. So I, I sing it at the top of my lungs. And they stopped me halfway through. I mean, I'm really, I'm into it. And Bill Yanutzi, the <laughs> music director, goes, uh, Mr. Rowe, you, um, you have no idea what you're saying, do you? And I said, no, sir, I, I don't. I got in the opera somehow. They took pity on me and they let me in. And then the craziest thing happened. The music was so much better than I thought. And the people were so much more interesting. I stayed for eight years. I was just, I was just a, a, in the chorus and the rep company. But I stayed for eight years. And while I sang, I auditioned for other things. And I got my union card. And as Robert Frost said, way leads on to way. And what started in the opera led to a misspent three years in the home shopping industry. And eventually I worked my way up to the sewer. Final shameless plug here on Merit. I got three shows. I got a show called Six Degrees, a history show for people who don't like history. I got Somebody's Gotta Do It, which is an extension of Dirty Jobs. And I got the story behind the story, which you're going to love. And I hope you love it too. And I'm so glad to be a part of the family. Well, you're going to see Micro a lot on Merritt Street Media, and he's got more than three shows because you're going to see him a lot on my show. You're going to see him a lot on the news. We've got something that's slipping around his ankle right now. He <laughs> thinks this is a building. It is, in fact, a prison. He's going to find it a lot harder to get out of this building than he found getting into the building. But if you're looking for Mike Rowe, you'll find him on Merritt Street Media. Mike, thanks for spending time with me today. What a privilege. See Thank you again. You, sir. I want to thank you all for watching just a small taste of what you can expect from Mike Rowe here on Merritt Street. Make sure to watch Mike's show, Somebody's Gotta Do It, here on Merritt Street. And make sure you go get your ticket to Mike's new movie, Something to Stand For, which I'm proud to say is in theaters now. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>